Good evening, virtual visitors. My name is Shakia Gillette. I'm the director of the African American History Initiative here at the Missouri Historical Society. Welcome to our program and thank you for joining us tonight. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters of the Zoo Museum Tax District. Thank you so much. Welcome to our Emancipation Day celebration. Everything about this evening's program is intentional. From the sounds of the McIntosh County Shouters performing the Southeastern Ring Shout, a tradition that dates back to the mid 1800s, to the riveting presentation by our program collaborators. The first segment of tonight's program is presented by Dr. Miller W. Boyd III. His lecture will highlight the experience of African Americans immediately following emancipation in Missouri. Dr. Boyd is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and is currently a ninth grade social studies teacher and director of the Stewart Scholars Program at, at the Whitfield School. Before coming to Whitfield, Dr. Boyd was a faculty instructor in the departments of history and African American studies at the University of Mississippi. Boyd completed his undergraduate degree in sociology at Xavier University in Louisiana. In May 2016, Boyd successfully defended his dissertation entitled Exigencies of the War, Black Military Service, Free Labor and Education in Civil War, Missouri. His most recent article, The Free People Who Have Bought Themselves Are Not Much Inclined to It, But the Others Are in Favor of It. Patterns of Black Enlistment in the Civil War in Missouri from 1863 to 1865 was published in the October 2016 edition of the Missouri Historical Review. The second segment of tonight's program is presented by Etta Daniels and Shelley Morris of Greenwood Cemetery. Greenwood Cemetery was organized in 1874 to serve the needs of the growing Black population of post-Civil War in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. It was, first, it, it was the first commercial non-secretarian cemetery for African Americans in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Etta Daniels is the head historian and archivist at Greenwood Cemetery. Joining us also from Greenwood Cemetery is Ms. Shelley Morris, who is also another historian. We are proud to partner with both Greenwood Cemetery and Dr. Miller Boyd to create a program that honors the lived experience and memory of our ancestors. Tonight's program will run for about 90 minutes, which includes a presentation from our panelists and a brief panel discussion and a 15 minute Q&A. So please be sure to ask all of your questions. And if you don't wanna hold them into the end, you can also pop those into the Q&A button, which you will see at the bottom of your, tool, of your toolbar. In order to streamline the process, we would prefer for you to wait until the end. But like I just mentioned, please feel free to go ahead and enter your questions during the program as well. If we are not able to answer all of your questions, please know that we will try our very best to get to as many as possible. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to our first presenter for the evening, Dr. Miller Boyd. Hi, Miller. Hello, good evening, how are you? I am wonderful. We are excited and ready to hear this presentation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, take it away. All right, could we advance to the first slide, please? All right, well, good evening, everyone. On January 11th of 1865, Missouri took the extraordinary step to abolish slavery throughout the state. Though Missouri had been trending in this direction for several years, the formal death of slavery was heralded as a milestone in the state's history. Looking back, we might characterize this measure as radical, revolutionary, or even transformative, but many contemporary observers were more circumspect about the passage of Missouri's Emancipation Ordinance and what it actually accomplished. The reality is, is that by the time Missouri abolished slavery on the state level, the institution had already been destabilized to the point of no return. Black military service, uh, the Second Confiscation Act, which was an act that allowed slaves of disloyal owners to petition for their freedom as early as July of 1862. And the thousands of enslaved Missourians who had escaped to freedom on their own 
had already pushed the institution of slavery to the brink by early 1864. While the passage of Missouri's Emancipation Ordinance might have been the formal recognition of something that had, in, in many ways, already become a reality, there were, however, several thousand Black Missourians who did receive their freedom through the actions of the state constitutional convention. But those who achieved their freedom before and after Emancipation Day 1865 knew that the fight for true Black equality in Missouri had only just begun. So tonight, with the time that I have, I'm gonna talk briefly about that stony road from freedom to equality for Black Missourians. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the African-American experience in Missouri during Reconstruction. Next slide, please. Now, most historians usually use January 1st, 1863, the date the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect as the beginning of Reconstruction. But since Missouri was a border state, a slave state that never left the Union, and therefore exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation, our discussion is going to begin with the passage of Missouri's Emancipation Ordinance. And to better help us understand the Black experience in Missouri during Reconstruction, I'm gonna focus on three points. First, I'm gonna discuss what it was like in the days and the weeks and the months after for those who did receive their freedom through Missouri's Emancipation Ordinance. Second, I'm gonna discuss the fight to secure voting rights for black Missouri men. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about what can definitely be seen as a bright spot in this discussion, advancements in black education in the post-war period. Next slide, please. Now, some commentators have spoken about Reconstruction in, in very idealistic terms, and others were a little bit more nuanced. And although he likened the end of this historic period as being akin to a return to slavery, W.E.B. Du Bois referred to Reconstruction as, quote, a brief moment in the sun, end quote, for former slaves. The reality was that even during that quote unquote brief moment of the sun, reconstruction was not the panacea that many black Missourians envisioned or hoped that it would be. For scores of black Missourians freed by the emancipation ordinance, life actually quickly went from bad to worse. In their proclamation, the General Assembly did not include any guidance as how emancipation would occur, nor did they provide any assistance to those who and one fell swoop, went from being dependent to being independent people. This resulted in a very disorderly process that placed thousands of formerly enslaved Missourians in perilous conditions during the height of a Missouri winter. Beginning, on Han beginning in Hannibal on January 12th, the day after the Emancipation Ordinance went into effect, Missouri slave owners began to evict former slaves from their plantations and farms in the dead of winter without adequate food or clothing. Some owners sent their newly free people, quote unquote, adrift, while others marched them to nearby military posts, expecting the army or local charitable organizations to take care of them. The provost marshal at Hannibal tried to stabilize the situation by ordering owners to provide some type of assistance until, quote, other provision could be made for them, end quote. Now, while military officials temporarily alleviated the situation at Hannibal, a more complicated set of circumstances was beginning to unfold at Columbia. Driven by their dislike of emancipation, as well as the banishment of some of the residents of Boone County days before, white citizens began to take out their frustrations on recently emancipated blacks. On January 22nd, the commanding officer at Columbia reported that there was a significant increase and the number of formerly enslaved people seeking aid, the vast majority being women and children with a family member in the army. And as it was at Hannibal, they too were, quote, turned out of the house and home without one meal or victuals and one cent of money, or even without wearing apparel suitable for winter or bed clothing to keep them from freezing this winter, end quote. Towards the end of February of 1865, military officials counted that nearly at least 4,000 people in mid-Missouri 
were in a similar condition. And deteriorating conditions at Columbia forced a sizable number of former slaves to seek refuge in overcrowded abandoned homes or makeshift shelters. Poor housing, lack of food, limited resources, and little access to medical treatment resulted in the proliferation of disease among former slaves at, in Columbia. And to make matters worse, while refusing to provide sanctuary for former slaves, whites instituted a boycott of black labor in Columbia. Now, prior to emancipation, most recognized that slavery was a dying institution and they had begun to pay wages through a free labor system that was overseen by the Union Army. But now with slavery dead, whites at Columbia tried to make freedom untenable for formerly enslaved Missourians. So to alleviate a, a situation that was quickly becoming a humanitarian crisis, Major General Grenville Dodge, commander of the Department of Missouri, instructed officers at Columbia to find work for indigent former slaves and to protect them from the, and those who hired and boarded them from retribution. Dodge further prohibited former slave owners from leaving former slaves destitute and without adequate provisions. He noted that, quote, no person who owns slaves and has received their labor will be allowed to leave them out in the cold. The citizens must support them until they can take care of themselves, end quote. Yet, with these protections in place, it was still very dangerous to be a recently emancipated person, especially in Missouri, an area that was also referred to as Little Dixie because of its support of the Confederacy. In February, Confederate guerrillas near Columbia issued a warning instructing, quote, all blacks to leave in 10 days or be killed by them, end quote. And true to their words, Bushwhackers lynched a black man near Columbia and killed another in neighboring Callaway County. Similar murders continued in the area through April and expanded to other parts of Missouri by May. A group of perpetrators, seemingly part of an organized effort, explained that their actions were motivated by a desire to reinstate slavery. And a warning posted on a storefront in Little Dixie, this group announced that they intended to, quote, so treat all Negroes who did not continue with their former masters as when lawfully their slaves, end quote. Next slide, please. Reflecting on the staggering increase in violence against formerly enslaved Missourians and the wholesale rejection of emancipation by a significant number of whites in mid-Missouri, Brigadier General Clinton Fisk lamented, quote, Slavery dies hard. I hear its expiring agonies and witness its contortions and death in every quarter of my district. And Boone, Howard, Randolph, and Callaway, the Emancipation Ordinance has caused disruption of society equal to anything I saw in Arkansas or Mississippi in the year of 1863. I blush for my race when I discover the wicked barbarity uh, of the late masters and mistresses of the recently freed persons of the counties heretofore named, end quote. Despite the fact that a number of Confederate guerrillas surrendered by the end of June 1865, violence against former slaves continued through the entirety of Reconstruction. But while a number of Black Missourians were literally struggling to survive, others attempted to carve out a more equitable future for the race. With the formal abolition of chattel slavery in Missouri, African Americans envisioned a new framework of freedom, one that would grant them full equality and protection under the law. Black soldiers, citizens, and abolitionists understood that although they believed that full citizenship, including voting rights, should be a self-evident next step after emancipation, they were painfully aware that they would have to fight to make equality a reality. Now, Missouri's Emancipation Ordinance had passed with little opposition, but state constitutional convention delegates were divided on the question of providing additional rights to African Americans, including the right to vote and hold office. An action by the state convention threatened to make African Americans quasi-citizens instead of full, full citizens of the state of Missouri. Next slide, please. 
The Missouri Daily Republican, I, the leading state newspaper, argued that the state convention had a duty to make full citizenship for Black Missourians a reality. They noted, quote, though we no longer have any slaves in Missouri, the convention has not abolished the Negroes. And henceforth, it will be part of a practical statementship to consider the condition of the Black people for the purpose of delivering proper legislation on the subject, end quote. Now, another important uh, newspaper, the New York Times, praised the convention delegates for abolishing slavery, but it also echoed the se sentiment of the Missouri Daily Republican. They wrote, quote, it will be well enough not to so overwhelm them with congratulations that they lose sight of the fact that but half their task is done. But the great minded and just hold that the war had, if not abolished, at least so weakened slavery as to render it burdensome to the mass and inoperative. And mere declaring that slaves to be free simply removed legal strengths, which were already neutralized by the existence of the war. They hold that except the freedman is made equal before the law, that the legal status of the slave is but little altered in Missouri, and that until rebels are disenfranchised and the freedmen admitted to the rights of citizenship, the progressives of Missouri will fall short of their high duty to humanity and the future." End quote. Now the state convention eventually inserted language into the proposed constitution to allow all citizens, regardless of race, to testify in court. Delegates also empowered the General Assembly to fund African-American schools. But questions about providing voting rights to African-American men was a far more contentious issue for the state convention to consider. Next quote, please. I mean, I'm sorry, next slide. <laughs> Missouri conservative delegates vehemently opposed extending voting rights to black men, while some Missouri radicals like German-born convention president Arnold Kreckel, who we see on the left, believed in full equality for Blacks and supported it. Other radicals, like convention vice president Charles Drake, who we see on the right, feared that Missouri voters would reject the entire new constitution based on its affirmation of Black suffrage. And since the convention lacked a, a consensus, pro-suffrage delegates offered several compromise amendments. Of note, Kreckel proposed to give voting rights starting in 1870 only to upstanding literate black veterans, as well as men who were too young to serve during the war. But unfortunately, few delegates warmed to this particular amendment. Some reasoning as the Holt County, County Sentinel did that quote, though the colored troops fought bravely is no evidence that they would vote wisely, end quote. Delegates to the state constitutional convention wrestled with the issue of black voting rights through the month of February and most of March. Next slide, please. Now, as the state convention debated whether to give black men the right to vote, African-Americans also voiced their opinion on the matter. A memorial to the state legislature signed by over 200 African-American men in St. Louis, the vast majority being freed before the war, clearly articulated the reasons why they should receive the right to vote. Their arguments in many ways were shaped by a measure of classism among what some refer to as the black elite, as their words inferred that only the vote should extend to only certain qualified black men. First, the petitioners cited their quote unquote, patriotism in a time of peril, end quote, as well as their loyalty to both the United States and the state of Missouri. Secondly, they pointed to the more than 8,000 black men, both free and freed from Missouri, who enlisted or were drafted into the federal army. Now, although very free, few men freed before the war served in the USCT, the memorialists referred to themselves as, quote, the only true representatives of black veterans, end quote. Thirdly, as taxpayers, they argued that, quote, taxation and representation are inseparable, end quote. Lastly, leaking literacy to citizenship, they noted that they were fully capable of reading both the constitutions of the United States and of the state of Missouri. As highlighted by the petitioners, the memorial has provided proof of their literacy by having each man sign their names to the appeal instead of making their mark. Next uh, slide, please. 
The freed uh, men of St. Louis were not the only group of black men who sent correspondence to the state constitutional convention arguing for the vote. Soldiers from Missouri's first black regiment, the 56th USCT, also made an impassioned plea directly to the state convention. Like the group from St. Louis, they provided succinct arguments as to why they especially should be given voting rights and why their manhood should be recognized in the new state constitution. They pointed not only to their character and their fidelity to the state and nation during the war, but also to the tremendous sacrifice made by their brothers in arms defending the Union. They stated, quote, we are ready to obey and sustain the laws of the land, ready to maintain and defend the government with our arms, and if need be, to die for it, as many of our brave comrades have already done, end quote. The white officers of the, this, this regiment, the 56th, also wrote to the state convention in support of their soldiers' petition and firmly believed that their service in defense of the nation should be grounds enough to grant them the right to vote and hold office. Further, they ardently believed that if there was any discussion of allowing former Confederate soldiers to vote, that African-American soldiers should be at least given the vote as well. They wrote that, quote, certainly their unwavering loyalty entitles them to as much consideration as the bloodstained rebel and bushwhacker of Price's army, end quote. But despite the advocacy of all three groups, delegates failed to act. And unable to reach a compromise on March 28th, the state convention moved that, quote, the question of Negro suffrage be indefinitely postponed, end quote. And as such, African-American men would be denied the right to vote and hold office in Missouri for the time being. But despite not being granted the right to vote through the state constitutional convention, African-American Missourians and Blacks in other states continued to agitate for the right to vote. Discussions both formal and informal continued in the streets, homes and churches concerning how to respond to Missouri's continued ban on black voting. And as a result, African-Americans in Missouri, like their counterparts across the country, held meetings and rallies to bring attention to their cause. The most notable organization to address the plight of blacks in the post-war period was the Missouri Equal Rights League, which was founded in October of 1865. Next slide, please. The Missouri Equal Rights League emerged as an extension of the National Equal Rights League, which formed a year earlier. Leading members of Missouri's African-American community, such as James Milton Turner, the eventual uh, ambassador to Liberia, who's on the left, uh, Reverend Moses Dixon, uh, a, another important community leader, and Blanche K. Bruce, the first African-American elected to the U.S. Senate, and others became active in the Missouri Equal Rights League to advance the cause of black suffrage. But despite a valiant multi-year effort, the Missouri Equal Rights League was unable to persuade the state legislature to extend the franchise to black men. Missouri would finally be forced to give black men the right to vote beginning in the 1870s after the states ratified the 15th Amendment. Black women, and women in general, as we know, would have to wait until much later to have their voting rights realized. And despite the fact that black men were elected to the US House of Representatives and the US Senate and former slates like South Carolina and Mississippi because of their large African-American populations during Reconstruction, Missouri would not have its first black congressman until 1969. So the question begs itself, were there any bright spots for Blacks in Missouri during Reconstruction? The answer is yes. Despite the challenges of, challenges of the post-emancipation period, African-Americans made great strides in a number of different fields. Our other panelists will, in a few minutes, talk about those stories uh, a little later on in this program. The greatest legacy of Black Missourians during Reconstruction, however, was education. On linking literacy with rebellion, Missouri made it illegal to teach Blacks and mixed race people beginning in 1847. This did not, however, stop African-American Missourians from attempting to gain some semblance of an education. 
clandestine schools, uh, like the one run by John Meacham Berry, who interestingly enough, if you know the story, uh, held classes on a barge in the middle of uh, the Mississippi River to hopefully avoid prosecution, uh, continued to operate in defiance of state law. During the war, tuition schools run by black educator, educators like Hiram Revels, the first actual black senator appointed uh, to the US Senate from Mississippi, and Mary Jane Patterson, uh, maternal grandmother of Langston Hughes and the widow of Louis Leary, who was involved in the John Brown raid, they would operate schools through at least early 1865 with varying degrees of success. Next slide, please. The American Missionary Association also moved into Missouri during the war and established schools across the state. Interestingly enough, white officers serving in black Union regiments also taught classes for black soldiers uh, at Benton Barracks where black soldiers uh, from Missouri were mustered in and after they had been dispatched to various locations around the South. In the post-emancipation period, Missouri's 1865 Constitutional Convention empowered the General Assembly to fund black schools. And that support would fluctuate through reconstruction as black students would receive a separate and unequal education in comparison to their white counterparts. As many of us know, in St. Louis in 1875, the public school board would create the first African-American high school west of the Mississippi, Sumner High School. And sadly, as you, some of you may have heard, Sumner's future hangs in the balance currently because the St. Louis public school system is debating whether to close Sumner after 146 of service to the community. It would be a, a shame if we were to lose that important school. In my opinion, when we talk about black education during reconstruction, the, the greatest legacy was the founding of Lincoln University in Jefferson City in 1866. Now, the impetus for creating an African-American college in Missouri resulted and materialized as a result of the shared wartime experience of black soldiers and white officers of the 62nd United States Colored Infantry, a Missouri-based black Civil War regiment. Black soldiers throughout the army often received their first lessons in reading and writing during their time in the service. And self-improvement as it related to education was an important life, part of life for soldiers of the 62nd USCT. White officers believing that African-Americans would achieve some measure of equality after the war encouraged black soldiers to be prepared for the duties of citizenship and push them to learn how to read and write. Black soldiers sensing the shift in their social position also believed that literacy would be crucial to their success as independent people in the post-war period. And further, probably more importantly, African-Americans, especially those who had obtained their freedom by way of military service, often saw literacy as essential to throwing off the last vestiges of their enslavement. Next slide, please. Now, the formal founding of Lincoln, Uni Lincoln University, then uh, called Lincoln Institute, was born out of conversations between white officers of the 62nd USCT starting around January of 1866. Lieutenant Richard Baxter Foster, a former educator before the war, hoped to open a small school for former soldiers after the war because he was concerned about their prospects in the post-war period. Another officer, Adam Aronson, had something bigger in mind. He and others hoped that with financial support of the white officers and the black enlisted men of the regiment, that Richard Foster would open a school for higher education back in Missouri. Now you would think that Foster would have jumped at the opportunity, but the reality is he didn't. He actually hesitated to answer yes. Honestly, I think it was the thought of establishing a school for higher ed it was definitely a far greater undertaking than simply putting up a schoolhouse, which Baxter hoped to do in Missouri. Nonetheless, Foster eventually gave in and agreed to he head the proposed school. And this got the ball rolling. Soon thereafter, Adamson met with uh, the, the regimental officers who pledged to financially support the school. And aside from raising seat money at this meeting, Adamson also worked out a framework for operation. And this is 
these are the actual words that he came up with. Quote, first, the Institute shall be designed for the special benefit of the freed blacks. Second, it shall be located in the state of Missouri. Third, its fundamental idea shall to be, to be to combine study with labor so that the old habits of those who have always labored but never studied shall not be, thereby be changed and that the emancipated slaves who have neither capital to spend nor time to lose may obtain an education, end quote. Now, although white officers like Foster and Aronson initiated the, the effort, Lincoln would not exist if it was not for both white officers and black enlisted men working together for a common goal. Black veterans would play key roles in organizing fundraising, I'm sorry, organizing fundraising efforts, would serve on the board of directors, and would be among the first students admitted to the school. White officers from the 62nd gave more than $1,000 to found Lincoln. Black enlisted men who made on average between 10 and $13 a month gave nearly $4,000 to the cause. Members of the 65th, 65th USCT, another Missouri-based Black regiment, gave nearly $1,400. But of the donations that poured in from the 65th, one gift stands out. Originally a member of the 67th USCT, another Black regiment, Private Samuel Sexton more than likely first heard about the proposed school when his former regiment merged with the 65th in July of 1865. Seemingly moved by the vision of Foster and others, Sexton selflessly gave $100, an amount that equaled nearly two thirds of his annual salary. Now, after raising seed money, Foster and the board went forward with a plan to establish a school at Jefferson City. And on June 25th, 1866, they filed papers to incorporate what was then called Lincoln Institute. Foster eventually secured what he called, quote, a shell, a wreck, a ruin of a house, end quote, with 44 square feet of space from Jefferson City. And on September 17th of 1866, Lincoln Institute held its first class with Foster as its principal. Two students, Cornelius Chappelle and board member, First Sergeant Henry Brown, both former slaves, made up Lincoln's inaugural class. Next slide, please. Now in the years after its founding, Lincoln Institute expanded and became a beacon of black education in the region. And following the admission of Chappelle and Brown, more students, all who had been enslaved before the war, enrolled and took one of the nearly 20 different courses offered by the school. And by 1870, Lincoln Institute can also contain a primary, an intermediate, and a high school. It was publicly funded by the state of Missouri. And finally, in 1880, the school named Inman Page, a 26-year-old Black graduate of Brown University, as its first president. Now, the story of the founding of Lincoln, the fight for Black voting rights, and the disorderly collapse of slavery in Missouri are just several examples as why, as why, why it is important to study not only general histories of the Civil War and Reconstruction, but also state and local narratives. Missouri's unique African-American history is one that should be more readily explored by scholars and lay people alike. Reconstruction was a mixed bag for Black Missourians, but the advancements made during this crucial time period created a foundation for the type of advocacy that would be needed to finally defeat Jim Crow in the 20th century. The Black experience in Missouri during Reconstruction is one to be celebrated and not ignored. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miller. That was awesome. Um, we are going to continue with our program, and I am going to invite Miss Etta Daniels. Hi, Miss Etta. Hello, hello. <laughs> How are you? Okay. Yeah. The floor is all yours. All righty. Well, as uh, Dr. Boyd has told us, emancipation came to Missouri in 1865. 
And while it was greeted with celebration and jubilation by Blacks, whites often held a totally different opinion. Surprise, surprise. On Saturday, September 7th, 1867, Henry Davis, owner and editor of the Lexington, Lexington Weekly Caucasian, a white supremacist newspaper, published an article that read in part, the position of the Negro is vassalage. He must deteriorate and finally disappear or go back into bondage. Legally free, but without money, property, or formal education, with no political power and no protection from, from violence, Davis's statement reflected a widely held opinion of recently freed slaves in Missouri. As vassals, black lives and black, black bodies had value for their labor and for their ability to produce children, both of which were a means to enrich their white slave owners' pockets. Free, some thought they had no reason to exist at all. While Henry Davis undoubtedly spoke for many Missourians, those most affected by emancipation, the people who had been emancipated, would prove them wrong. It would not happen overnight. The years ahead would prove to be extremely difficult, but Missouri's freed men and women would consistently work toward a future where they could obtain an education, secure gainful employment, ensure the safety of their families and communities, and assert their rights as American citizens, especially the right to vote. Progress would come in small steps. Progress would take many years, but it would come. For one thing, those who the Lexington Weekly Caucasian would go on to describe as an enemy were descendants of a people who had survived the horrors of the Middle Passage. They were descendants of people who had already survived more than two centuries of brutal dehuman, dehuman, I'm sorry, dehumanizing slavery. They themselves were survivors. With the, with the passed down knowledge of a bitter past, with no control over what might happen to them or they, their children, they prayed for a future that would include freedom. Former slave Alice Sewell decides, described her early religious experience and praying for freedom during slavery this way. We were allowed to go to church on Sunday. A white preacher would preach to us but all he ever said was be good servants, don't steal no chickens and don't lie about anything. Even though they baptized us, they never said anything about a slave dying and going to heaven. You were just dead and that's all there was to it. But we used to slip off into the woods and pray to our own liking. We prayed for freedom. We prayed to God that if we did not live to see it, please let our children live to see a better day and be free. But freedom had been long in coming and it had been paid for by the bloody currency of human lives. Neither disappearing or returning to bondage were options to be even considered by Alice Sewell and people like her. In 1867, most free persons did not own property. They worked at low paying unskilled jobs Often their pay was only room and board. In some cases, the room was a former slave cabin and the board was the same food they had eaten while enslaved. But change was in the wind and sometimes it came from unexpected places and bought, brought with it unintended consequences. From the very beginning of the enslavement of African peoples, Christianity had been a part of the justification of slavery. The fact that the souls gained for Christ through conversion to Christianity were housed in the body of persons who were enslaved and treated without mercy appeared to be of no consequence. But actions do have consequences. Like Alice Sewell, most enslaved people here in Missouri, as well as the rest of the United States, fully embraced the religion of their owners. 
not only were they Christians, some of them also attended and were even considered members of the same churches that their owners attended. Enslaved church members were almost always segregated in some way. It was common that they were required to worship in a balcony or in the back rows of the church or at a different time than white congregants and always with supervision. Mary Bell Rice of Howard County reported that she attended the same church as her owner, Kitty Diggs. The white people went to church in the morning and the slaves went in the afternoon. However, after emancipation, whites became increasingly uncomfortable with even those kinds of arrangements. What seemed to bother them most was the social equality suggested by the presence of black members in their churches. A common reaction was to dismiss blacks from their congregation entirely. Sometimes, probably out of a sense of guilt, they went as far as encouraging and even in, uh, assisting their former bondsmen in forming and building their own churches. However, that's where the unintended consequences comes in. Free from oversight and outside control, black churches would become a refuge from the dehumanizing forces of the white power structure. What began as an effort to remove an unwanted group from public worship had the unintended consequence of creating a powerful instrument of self-determination, a place of learning and a tool for economic advancement among other things. No matter where they were located from the Boot Hill to Little Dixie, from St. Louis to Kansas City, black churches provided aid and comfort to a weary impoverished and struggling population of formerly enslaved men and women. And for this reason, churches often became the targets of violence and terrorism. In 1867, a Christmas Eve service at St. Paul's AME Church in Columbia was interrupted by a drunken mob who wounded and killed members of the congregation. Nevertheless, by 1877, which is usually considered the end of the Reconstruction era, there were hundreds of black churches in Missouri, each offering opportunities for self-improvement and most of all, education. One of the most sought after rights of former slaves was the right to an education. In 1847, state legislation had been passed to make education of black people slave or free illegal. Pre-war efforts at providing education for blacks had been met with opposition, intimidation, and threats of physical violence. But with emancipation came another opportunity for book learning. Lincoln Institute, uh, as discussed by Dr. Boyd, was of course the most widely known of the schools established after emancipation, but it was not the only educational opportunity. During the reconstruction years, small schools were established across the state by organizations such as the American Missionary Association, the Western Sanitary Commission, and the Freedmen's Bureau, all with the objective of providing a basic education to the mostly impoverished former slaves. Some of the schools met a fate like those in New Madrid and Fenton. They were burned to the ground and their teachers were told to get away and stay away. However, the thirst for education was so great that while the threat of violence and the reality of poverty sometimes delayed education, it did not deter it. Formerly enslaved men and women took advantage of the opportunity to learn to read and write. And if they could not attend school, they made sacrifices to make sure that their children could, even if it was only for a few months at a time. In her interview for the WPA Federal Writers Project, 
Sarah Graves from Skidmore said that when freedom came, all the money her mother had was 50 cents. Still, she wanted her children to get some education. Sarah was able to go to school for two winters, but could never attend for a full term because she had to work to help to support her family. Perry McGee of Fayette, who never learned to read or write, said this, I went naked, barefooted, and hungry to send my children to school, and his efforts paid off. He managed to send his two daughters to Lincoln Institute, and his daughters, Alice and Bessie, who both had been born free, became school teachers. Now, even though Sarah Graves was never able to advance her book learning, she was able to accomplish another freedman's dream. In 1877, with hard work and no help, she and her husband, Jimmy, were able to buy their own 10-acre farm in rural Nottoway County. Her experience as a landowner reflected that of others. She said, things changed. We worked for ourselves. What we had was ours and no more whippings. Sarah and her husband are examples of individual progress from enslavement to land ownership. But there are also examples of land ownership taken to a new and totally unexpected level. In 1871, a former slave named Joe Penny purchased eight acres of land in Saline County and founded what would become Pennytown, Missouri, the first black town in the state of Missouri. The self-sufficient town was populated by former slaves who survived by sharing both resources and responsibilities. The town began with 10 families. Some of the residents raised cows, others raised hogs or chicken. Some grew crops, some wove cloth. Even the elders contributed by cooking and taking care of children. The community needed no guidance or outside help. They simply did what they had done all their lives, only now, like Sarah and Jimmy Graves, they were the beneficiaries of their own labor. Recognizing the need for both independence and social safety nets and socialization in what was awful, what in what were often hostile surroundings. By the early 1870s, free men and women had begun to organize such groups and clubs like the United Brothers of Friendship and the Templar Knights of America. On the one hand, these organizations were designed to add a much needed layer of protection in terms of assistance in times of illness and death. Many were patterned after Masonic organizations such as Prince Hall Masons and the Order of Eastern Star. They offered companionship, structure, education, and entertainment. The Mosaic Templars is particularly interesting because it was an organization that upon death provided its members with a headstone to mark their passage. Many, if not most of the founders of these types of organizations had been born enslaved like John Nolan of DeSoto these were men who the Lexington Weekly Caucasian said must surely dissipate and disappear. But John Nolan did neither. Instead, he learned to read and write. He became a minister of the gospel. He organized a chapter of the Mosaic Templars of America and served his community by helping to ensure that their passage through a hostile world would not go unnoted. The Templar Knights of America still exists, and uh, one of their headstones is actually at Greenwood Cemetery. We're very proud of that. They're, they're rarely seen in this part of the country, but we do have one there. 
Unfortunately, the common dreams of self-determination, education, employment, and safety would remain elusive for the vast majority of freed men and women. Instead of prosperity, there was hunger, illness, and fear. But those conditions were less the fault of those who simply wanted to live their lives in peace and freedom, and more the fault of the depravity and hatred of their former enslavers who wished to see them back in shackles. The fact that their former slaves continued to survive enraged them. The fact that they did not dissipate, disappear or return to or beg to return to bondage drove them to increasing levels of violence. All told, the men and women who lived through the first dozen years of slavery made tremendous progress, even if that progress was only to defy those who considered themselves their superiors by staying alive. I would like to leave you with this thought. The Lexington Weekly Caucasian was published from 1866 to 1875. By the end of the Reconstruction era, it had dissipated and disappeared, but the people it disparaged as inferiors and vassals would continue to survive and would thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Etta, for that presentation. All right, thank you, virtual visitors, for hanging in there with us. We are now going to turn the floor over to Ms. Shelley Morris. Hi, Shelley. Hi. Thank, thank you for you. joining us this evening. Oh, thank you so much. The floor is all yours. All right. As Reconstruction ended, white Southerners and the conservative Democratic Party used violence and economic exploitation, biased laws, and political disenfranchisement to subjugate African Americans and to undo their gains during Reconstruction. Next slide. Next slide, please. While the Black man is ostensibly free to vote due to the 15th Amendment, he was, subject, he was subjected to threats and violence for attempting to vote freely. And in, in this uh, quote here, it says, let it be known before the election that farmers have agreed to spot every leading radical Negro in the county and treat him as an enemy for all to come or for all time to come. The rotten ring must and shall be broken at, at any and all cost. The Democrats have determined to withdraw all employment from their enemies. Let this fact be known. Next slide, please. Black Americans would be deprived of the right to vote by a poll tax of $2 and a literacy test which most failed to pass. In fear of retribution and supporting their families, terror tactics and acts of violence perpetrated by the Ku Klux Klan to maintain racial segregation in the South escalated. A mass migration began from such states as Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Texas, and Arkansas. Next slide, please. Historian Nell Irving Painter describes in her book, The Exodusters, Black Migration to Kansas After Reconstruction, how some African-Americans had learned to read, some even earned money. It was enough to shape ideas of freedom no longer to be creatures of another's will, no longer chattel. Many had heard that Kansas was the new promised land and much like the Exodus in the Bible, they set out with the clothes on their backs and with whatever they could carry, most having little, little money to pay or for transportation aboard the boats that headed north. There was no government sponsored river boats to provide transportation. So they would gather along the Mississippi banks, hoping that a boat would stop, you know, to allow them passage. And if they were lucky enough for one, uh, did they even have the fee to board? Yet they were determined to leave the South. 
they knew life anywhere, no matter the struggle, was better than living under Jim Crow laws and the Democrats. The Homestead Act of 1862 provided an opportunity to own land and that attracted many to the Great Plains. Early in March, 1879, 250 exodusters landed on the St. Louis Wharf. None were prepared for the cold, damp weather. In his book, The St. Louis African-American Community and the Exodusters, Brian M. Jack wrote, they resembled refugees from war more, more than homesteaders. He went on to quote Andrew Pollard, a former Mississippi state senator who described them as refugees fleeing from bondage. And as refugees, they were not expected to be fully equipped like, like the colonists. Needing shelter, you, next slide please. Needing shelter and food men and women and children arrived on the doorsteps of St. Louis in March without the luxury of a coat and threadbare clothing and some were barefoot. Next slide, please. None were prepared for the harsh winters. Such conditions led to health problems. Approximately six weeks into the exodus, a health report stated that dozens of the exodusters were suffering from bronchitis, malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, dysentery, and measles. Many died by the hundreds. Adding to their strife, many lacked funds to further their journey west. Next slide, please. Their plight did not go unnoticed. In the Black community of St. Louis, many, could many of the St. Louisans could relate to their struggles. As Black people, as, as Ms. Daniels and Dr. Boyd had said in their presentations, life was difficult for, for, Af for the African-American in St. Louis. So many of us could relate to what they were going through and all they needed was just a, a hand, just an assistant, someone to care. One such person was Charlton Tandy. He was a well-respected Republican, gained political ties during the Civil War. He helped protect St. Louisans by forming an African-American militia known as the Tandy Guard, a well-known speaker and civil rights activist who fought for others' rights. He immediately began reaching out to the community to find shelter and food. He soon learned there were, there were still more exodusters to come. By the end of the exodusters period in 1880, over 20,000 people had come to the city's piers. Receiving a tip from a friend, Tandy went before the Melanthi board, which is an Irish charity set up to help the homeless. There he received very, very little assistance. St. Louis white community and the public officials did not want the exodusters here. They only added to the city's impover impoverished conditions. So they turned a blind eye to their new arrivals. But not to be deterred, Tandy reached out to a few allies the African-American church. Just as Ms. Daniels had said earlier, that was a place that we could come and we could learn, we could thrive within our own group. They stepped up and they showed out. Members of the St. Louis community were on hand to greet the new arrivals and at least two thirds of the ex exodusters were housed and fed within the St. Louis church. Some stayed in homes and others stayed in abandoned buildings. All the while their travel uh, to Kansas City, to, not to Kansas City, to Kansas State was being arranged. The community also made sure that the innocent and the naive migrants weren't persuaded by the darker side of the city. Pimps were always looking for new associates. St. Louis black leaders and hundreds from the community gathered at St. Paul AME Church chapel to strategize about how to meet the needs of the ex exodusters. By the end of March, approximately 2,500 exodusters had arrived. Thousands more were coming in the, in the upcoming months. Black St. Louisans had to prepare. Next slide, please. From the initial, from the initial meeting, the committee of 15 was formed. Later, it was renamed to the Committee of 25. 
Charlton Tandy was elected president, Moses Dixon, Reverend John Turner, John Johnson, John W. Wheeler were elected officers. They were charged with organizing transportation and temporary housing, housing for over 10,000 or more travelers. By mid-April of 1879, the committee split again, forming the Colored Refugee Relief Board, which was, which was charged with finding housing and transportation, while the Colored Immigration Aid Society raised money to form new, new Black townships in the West. The main objective was to see the exodusters served and to see them through to their destinations. Since little financial help would come from the white St. Louisans, they began to reach out to black communities and former, I'm sorry, former abolitionists across the country to raise money and, and, and clothing and what have you to provide for the exodusters. Reverend John Turner sent letters while Charlton Tandy traveled to Washington, D.C. to seek help. Frederick, I'm sorry, conservative African -Amer Americans such as Frederick Douglass criticized the exodusters for leaving the South. He believed their labor made them a valuable asset and whites would soon realize this. They would find themselves in competition with Southern white farmers and the laborers in the North by leaving the South. He maintained he didn't disagree with the principle. He felt that the movement was ill-timed and poorly organized. After being refused by Frederick Douglass and attaining proper introductions in Washington, C, Washington DC elite circles, Charlton Tandy sought out R.T. Greener, Dean of Howard University. It was Greener who introduced him to President Hayes and other national Republicans. Though he received no financial support, he did garner not only the president's support, but also recognition in the Eastern newspapers, which brought more attention to the exodusters' plight. So money started pouring in from across the country. While Tandy was trying to raise national aware and awareness, the St. Louis Committee was not without its problems of running the organization smoothly. There were often heated exchanges between the leaders on what was the best course of action. John Milton Turner severed his ties with the organization with the accusation of mis misappropriation of funds. To prove that there was no misdeeds, the committee gladly shared his financial records with the Globe Democrat, which printed daily. John Milton Turner formed his own committee, which ultimately, ultimately proved unsuccessful. Next slide, please. Over the next year, next slide. Over the next year, yes, thank you. Over the next year, exodusters continued to make their way to the West. By the end of the era, approximately 40,000 African Americans made their way from the South and settled in, in Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Kansas, while some made St. Louis their home. The exodus began to subside by early summer of 1879. In a 10-year period, Kansas had a Black population growth of almost 27,000 people, 27 individual dreams of a better life, 27,000 people who acted on their desires. The exodusters were an example of the lengths that African Americans would go through to maintain their hard won freedom and what they were promised since the Emancipation Proclamation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ms. Shelley. That was a wonderful presentation. At this time, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to turn on your cameras, please. And let's engage in a bit of a conversation. Um, I would like to talk about a, a common thread that we, we heard throughout all three presentations. So Dr. Boyd, you, you also mentioned the importance of the Black church. Um, I was wondering if you each could kind of speak to that um, and where you see us today in terms of liberation and freedom. Oh, you, you, you've got a, a very big question you're, you're asking. 
Uh, well, the Black Church is going to be essential to organizing. Uh, it's going to be a place where people will be educated. And, and before, I guess, during the period that education was illegal for African Americans, uh, churches held clandestine schools. Uh, they would build them as Sunday schools. And it would be there that African Americans would get their first lessons in learning if they could get to a church that was uh, able to operate in secret uh, in, in that regard. Uh, churches are going to be essential for not just being a, a place that people can come on Sundays, but they were meeting houses. They were places where activism was planned. Uh, they were places that people who were destitute who could come, they could come there and hopefully try to find some relief. Uh, there were people there who would also uh, provide shelter, food to people like uh, the exodusters who were passing through, you know, desperate, leaving everything that they knew behind for a place they had never seen before, Kansas. So, I mean, the African-American church is, is always has been a foundation uh, of Black liberation, uh, emancipation, and still to this day, it plays a very important role, uh, especially politically. Uh, but the African American church, like I said, I think it's a unique institution, uh, one that I, I don't think it has a parallel uh, in modern American society. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and, you know, the African American churches in Missouri actually got their found their start here in St. Louis in 1817 when the uh, First Baptist Church Sunday School was organized. The church would come 10 years later in 1827. I was surprised uh, while reading about the number of uh, black churches in the rural areas. And to me, those were just extremely important. These people were just, how they survived is a mystery. The church was the one place that they could go consistently for refuge, for uh, spiritual strength, for food, for shelter, for any of their, and all of their needs would be met. Um, and I think that that is pretty much how the African-American church still functions as a place that you can come to, come together in, share ideas in, and uh, enrich your community from. Um, like uh, Dr. Boyd said, the African American church is, has been, and still continues to be indispensable as far as the uh, black community is concerned. The one thing I'd like to raise is that the black church today and how the, polit the politicians see it as evidence of the power of our black vote and one of the best ways to reach us is through our church. You know, mm -hmm. we're there in numbers and they can share their ideas. But it is, a, it's, I've always found it amazing that the only time sometimes you would see some politicians is when it was time to vote for them in, in office. And, uh, but, it, but it lets you know just how powerful a voting bod body we have. Uh, and we've seen that in Georgia. We've seen it here in St. Louis, especially. But just most recently in Georgia, where uh, persons like Stacey Abrams just turned things around there. And you know that it was mainly through going to the various churches as a group and, um, you know, and, and, and fighting for our causes. Thank you, Shelley. So, um, the stories of uh, Black churches in, in mid-Missouri, how the white power structure did not understand uh, the value of or power that would be unleashed through the Black church. I wonder, had they known, would they not have separated themselves? Would they have kept their former slaves in their congregations? Because by letting allowing us to create our own congregations, they literally changed they literally changed the power structure of blacks and whites. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Etta. So I had another question about 
your research process. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit about how you conduct your research, um, how you know how to include certain facts into your presentation? I know obviously we don't have all of the time in the world and you had to condense your presentation. So how do you conduct your research? Is there anything that you were unable to include in your presentation this evening that you want to tell our visitors? I think for me, uh, the way I conduct my research is uh, by going to the state archives and seeing what they have. And for me, you know, when I went off to grad school, I didn't initially plan to study this, this subject matter. I was going to look at the, the free people of color in antebellum Louisiana and how they reacted to the Louisiana Purchase. But I did a internship with the Missouri State Archives. And one of the things I was asked to do while I was in grad school was to create this narrative, uh, a short narrative of black soldiers in the Civil War in Missouri. And they gave me really access to almost any document they had in their possession. And going through there, I, I found that there was a story that did not really jive with what I assumed about black military service. And I went in thinking that black men just flooded the army to emancipate slaves, enslaved people nationwide. And what I did find was something that was a little bit different that was a little bit more nuanced and that black men really went into the military based on their own immediate needs. So if they didn't have any other, uh, I guess, options for labor, they went into the military. Uh, if they had better labor options, uh, if they were free people, they opted to stay out of the war uh, until they couldn't. And for me, it's like you go in there with an open mind, you see what's there. And as my, my late dissertation advisor told me, it's like, you let the documents tell the story. You don't go in there thinking that you know everything. Uh, you go in there with a very open mind and let the documents tell you the story. And, and for me, you know, I, looking at Reconstruction, it, it's a very complicated period. And it's a period that we sometimes overgeneralize. But one of the things that I have found and one of the things that's humbled me is that Missouri is very unique. What happens here in Missouri is, you know, it's kind of different than what happens nationwide in, in other former slave states. You know, for example, when we think about military governance of former slave states, in the South and large numbers of military protection, that didn't happen in Missouri. Missouri was not subject to the 1865 Reconstruction Act. They didn't have a large presence of standing soldiers who were there to protect black people. They didn't have those black congressmen and those black local officials because those other states had larger numbers of, of black people. And when the 15th amendment went into effect, they could vote those people in. So Missouri is, is always gonna be a mystery, me, a mystery to me in some form or fashion. And you know, while I might have an answer to one question, uh, I will probably come away with like a 10 other questions that will take me a long time to answer. One of the things that I'm always interested in is everyday people. Uh, people who like my great grandmother, whose lives were just, were just there. They were just everyday types of things. So I kind of gravitate toward newspapers. I enjoy reading the newspapers. And I also like taking a look at the other side of what is given as official doctrine, information, or something like that. Um, for example, I was reading a book just while preparing for this, and it said that three quarters of uh, freed slaves worked, by 1877, they still worked on the land. They, they, were, they were farmers, uh, unskilled laborers. But if three quarters of them were unskilled laborers, what did the other quarter do? And though, you know, those are the people that I'm always looking for. And I think those kinds of things le led me to um, the story of Pennytown. You know, I, I knew about that already, but the story of Pennytown and, um, story of certain seamstresses. I didn't, I, I didn't put those stories into what I had to say tonight, who, um, story of skilled laborers 
who had gained their skills during slavery and after slavery were able to use those skills to their benefit to start their own businesses, basically. So I kind of like newspapers and uh, like I said, looking at, the, looking at the other side of the facts that are, that are usually presented um, as facts, but also usually come from the perspective of uh, people other than Black people, basically. Mm -hmm. I think for myself, my process has always been reading the various books, but also news articles. I think Etta got me started on reading the old news articles. But I think about my family and they're coming up from uh, Mississippi and, and what they went through and how they helped others. And so it really um, struck a chord with me to read about the Exodusters. It kind of I guess made me understand, helped me understand my grandfather just a little bit more and, and how he would help others come up, come up to St. Louis and try to make a way. Um, but my process as far as research, going, like say, going to the libraries, which has been a little, little difficult with the COVID. So everything has been trying to research online for me. And um, so it hasn't been necessarily an easy process because of that. But at the same time, there's so much information out there and, and it's just there for everybody to read and to, you know, to find out about. Okay, thank you, Shelley. It looks like we have one question and I believe Dr. Boyd answered it, but I wanted to um, kind of bring in everyone on this discussion. Um, so we have a question, is there a good source for the early history of black churches, i.e. the Zion Church at 613 North Garrison, which was on Morgan Street. It is now called Washington Metropolitan AMEV Church. Dr. Boyd, would you like to- Yeah, uh, the only book I can think of off the top of my head is a uh, small book by Arnold Parks, uh, who is originally from St. Louis, but who currently resides in Jefferson City. He's got a pretty good overview of uh, kind of the evolution of the black church in Missouri. Uh, it probably would deserves, you know, a, like a larger treatment, but the, you know, for him to cover as many churches as he did, it was a, uh, an undertaking that I, I need to talk to him about because I don't know how he did it. Uh, he was a uh, church member of, of mine at my church, uh, Union Memorial United Methodist Church, which, which is the third oldest African-American church west of the Mississippi. Uh, founded 1846. And, you know, one of the, my passion projects, one of the things I'd love to do is to investigate that history uh, from its earliest beginnings as a, um, a church for enslaved people to today. But I think <laughs> that, you know, when you think about these churches and, and the, their evolution, sometimes records were kept and sometimes they weren't, or sometimes they had kept record, good records for a long time, but then they disappear. And we know that our African-American churches are changing. Uh, the trend is moving towards, you know, non-denominational churches and, and so forth. And so a lot of that history needs to be cataloged and preserved, or unfortunately it'll be lost. Exactly. Yeah. A very old book called a History, The History of Black Baptists. Uh, it's in tatters at this point, and I do need to pass it on to someone it's just a marvelous resource. It was written so, so long ago that it tends to incorporate a great deal of first hand information. Wonderful resource for uh, talking about how Black Baptist churches grew and expanded, not just here in St. Louis, but all across the state of Missouri. Uh, the names of churches, the pastors of churches, um, uh, various other officers. It's been out of print for many, many years, but um, it's well worth, if you're looking for information on Baptist churches, it's well worth taking a look at. Hmm. You know, I just thought of something. Uh, John Wright has that, that wonderful book, uh, Discovering African American St. Louis, which yes. covers a range of topics. And he does brief histories of numerous black institutions and black buildings and mm -hmm. sites including Black churches, that that's a, a really good uh, book, a uh, good reference. 
Thank you both for in-depth information on the AME churches. I wish I did because uh, you know so much. There is so much history there. Uh, AME churches were so instrumental in a lot of social movements here in the city, or well, really across the state. Uh, it would be nice to be able to, so if anybody knows of anything, I would surely be interested. Well, I just wanted to suggest um, Mother Bethel um, AME in Philadelphia. They have a really extensive archive there. Um, and they also have an archivist that works year round. Um, so if you are looking specifically for AME churches, um, you can contact them directly. AME Zion churches, that, that's another, that would be a, a, another course. Um, but I do know I have been to their on-site museum and it is extremely extensive. They have records um, dating back to the Underground Railroad. So if you are looking for AME specific information, you should definitely contact them. Um, we are, gosh, we are right at time. We are running out of time. So I wanna do- oh my goodness. I know, I wanna do a last call for questions and it looks like we have one more question. It just popped up. Oh, okay. Dr. Boyd, you answered that question. Thank you so much. We are going to close out our program. This was wonderful. And I just, again, you know, I really enjoy working with each of you and it is always a pleasure. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us this evening. Um, I could not have put together a better panel. I mean, each of you brought something different to this discussion. Um, it was definitely multifaceted. It had depth and it had a great deal of layers. And again, I just wanna thank you so much for your support over the years and everything that you continue to do in the community and how you continue to push forth the African-American narrative here in St. Louis. And to our virtual visitors, thank you for sticking around Thank you for sticking this out with us. If you would like to hear this presentation again, um, you can rewatch it next Monday. It will be live on our YouTube page. Um, and as, as always, your feedback is extremely important to us. So we'd really appreciate it if you could just take a short survey, um, a Kobo toolbox survey should have opened in your browser once you open this um, Zoom link. And if you have not seen it, just keep an eye out for it. Um, towards the end of the session. Um, I also posted a link in the chat box. If you are so inclined to support us with a membership, we would really appreciate it. Please click the link and that will give you more information on how to become a member at the Missouri Historical Society. And as always, um, please tune in and visit us on mohistory.org to learn more about our upcoming programs. We've listed our Black History Month programs that we have coming up in February. So we hope that you'll consider joining us on February 4th. We are extremely excited about that program. Um, and then we are gonna continue the theme of the Black family throughout the entire month of February. So you will hear about the Black family from <laughs> February 1 to the end of the month. And you'll probably hear about it throughout the year because we can talk about the Black family all year. So once again, thank you to our panelists for joining us. Thank you virtual visitors for sticking around and we look forward to seeing you again on February 4th. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you, Shakia. You're welcome. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful event. Thank you. <laughs>